How's it going, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Planeswalkers Pub. I'm your host, Aaron. Howdy, it's RJ. Today, we are going to be talking about the different types and strategies of commanders and the decks that use them. But first, let's talk about our signature card. Yes, every episode of the Planeswalkers Pub will feature a signature card that may or may not relate to the episode's topic. Today's signature card is Bog Witch. Bog Witch is a 1-1 human spell shaper for 2 and a black. It has pay 1 black, tap it, discard a card, add 3 black to your mana pool. Yeah, so this is basically just Dark Ritual on yeah. a creature. Every card is Dark Ritual. Like, That's, every <laughs> card in your hand is Dark Ritual Every now. card is Dark Ritual. I feel like this... And this is one of those things where I kind of randomly found this or whatever, and I... This is one of those cards I'm, I kind of want to put in Tesa. Like, I really, really Yeah, do. I would too. I want to put it in my Valari deck. I just I just built Dredge, and I want to start throwing cards in my hand away. Like, that's... this this it, It's plus, like, you know, the price is on screen right now, where I think it's only, like, 23 cents or something like that, so it's, like, it's cheap. It's stupid, stupid cheap. Um, and I love it absolute to death. And again, it's a common. Pauper. There exactly. you go. Build a Pauper Commander deck. I know, they're Pauper Now commander. you have uh, Dark Ritual in it. Crazy, crazy. I love it to death. Um, but anyway, let's talk about our main topic at hand, uh, which is different types and themes of Commander decks. So, Commander, for the most part, has actually been around for a very, very long time, and we've got a ton of cards to run with outside of actual Commanders themselves. Uh, so we're basically just going to kind of break down and kind of get a little overview of each individual card type that there is. And remember, we're human. We aren't going to know every single type of deck out there. But there's going to be archetypes that we're going to miss. Um, and not even that, but the fact that um, I'll put, I'll make sure that every single um, archetype, at the very least, and a chunk of them are on screen right now. Um, this way you guys can actually kind of see it. And if we miss one of your favorites some of that sense, we do apologize. But Let us know. Is... Tell us. Write it in the comments. That's... Send us an email. Smoke signals, you know. <laughs> Definitely smoke signals for the most part. We'll totally, totally see them. Um, all right, so let's just go ahead and jump into this. Um, I kind of tossed this list together a little hastily, uh, but the various, I'm pretty sure I hit all the main focus ones um, so that you guys can kind of see this as well as just the particular commanders that might want to go with them. Um, I say might because although you have a particular commander that says, I want to do this one thing, it can always go a different direction. Like, mm -hmm. You can technically build, like, you know, the Ur Dragon Super Friends. Although it might not seem like it will or work. Or a dragon group hug. Just my my thought. It might not work, but it's one of those things that, hey, this is Magic, more importantly, Commander is a casual format. So it basically states, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Lord Windgrace Mill, that probably would, wouldn't work, but hey. Well, maybe if it's like self-mill? No, I mean like milling your opponent with Lord Windgrace. Yeah, you got no blue. Exactly. That's why it wouldn't work. There might be different cards in that. I deserve that. Um, <laughs> Let let's jump it. right into this for the most part with our first card, or rather this our first type, which is going to be Super Friends. I decided to do Super Friends because, hey, we're the Planeswalkers pub. We should talk about Planeswalkers. That's yeah. what I need it. Um, and the number one, for the most part, Super Friends commander As we is all know. going to have to be Atraxa Praetor's Voice. She is a green, white, blue, black for a legendary creature, Angel Horror. So she is a 4-4 four -four for a Flying Vigilance Death Touch Life Linker. These days toss literally every keyword over they could possibly think of. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the beginning of your end step, proliferates. So the main reason why a lot of people are putting that into as their actual commander for Super Friends is because proliferates, um, in which case basically states that at the end of your turn, you basically can put an additional counter onto anything that has a current counter. You don't necessarily have to target your own things. Um, you can target like you know someone else's things. Notes, by the way, that the proliferate does not affect the commander tax. That's something that's just kind of an intangible thing. You're giving me this commander tax is a is a cost. It's not a, a physical thing. Exactly. It's not a counter that's it, added to a permanent. It's just it's an additional cost, like spectacle, like, or it's an alternative cost. Basically, that you have um, to pay. It's one of those things which is like you know that we technically would represent like you know commander tax by like you know just like a die on the commander and then that's where so you can't technically touch that, um, but it will affect basically everything else. Oh in, yeah, including in fact because they just uh, in with. Um, War of the Spark, they're, they changed how prolif proliferate works. It used to be only permanents 
you could add counters to, but they just added it to players as well. Yes. So, so now you can add an additional counter to anything. Yeah, and it gets bonkers very, 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 very quickly, um, and that's the reason why um, Super Friends is with Atraxa. Yeah. Moving on, the probably most common type of deck you'll see is Tribal. This is just, say, Bear Tribal, or Squirrel Tribal, Merfolk Tribal, Soldier Tribal, Rat Tribal, Elf Tribal, Dinosaur Tribal, Zombie Tribal. Um, uh, it's basically one of those things in which case that... Yeah, tribal for the most part is probably not so much. No, well, actually, I'll say it. Tribal's tribal is probably the most the easiest thing to actually put together for the most part, just because it's not that hard. Um, let's mm. take like you know one of the standard tribal decks for the most part, which is the one I actually started with, um, Azori, uh, Renegade Leader. In which case, he is a one green green for a legendary mm. creature, Elf Warrior, um, elf. and he get a two two. Um, he states Santa's that little helpers. <laughs> yes, elves. Santa's little helpers. Um, and it states that you pay a green to generate target elf, or you pay two green, 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 and elves you control, or elf creatures you control get plus three, plus three, and gain trample to end of turn. So, he's an elf tribal commander. Pay five mana win. Most of the time, yeah, because elves usually have, like, you know, a bunch of, like, you know, pump effects or something like that. So, like, you know, elves yeah. don't always come in very small, like, you know, linear elf packages. They tend to, like, you know, have, like, a become a lot bigger. There is a, what is it, a 5-3 or whatever, that actually, like, when it attacks this guy's trample, you can't block it with uh, creatures with two or less power. Um, Pretty sure. The Defender one? No, it's a, it's an elf. <laughs> what? Yeah, she's a 5-3 that you can't block it um, with creatures with two or less, and she's got trample. Like, it's it's dumb. She's dumb. Um, elf Boy has her. It's... Elf Boy is a friend of ours whose uh, only commander deck right now is an elf tribal deck. So we call is, him Elf Boy. Because it is actually his commander is Azori, and elves are pretty much the easiest one because they've created a ton, ton of oh, elves. Yeah. Um, there's like 8 million, or there's, I think, like, to be realistic, like three or four different Lanawar elf reprints, Elvish Mystic Lanawar elves. There's that really old one that I think came before Lanawar elves. It's the same thing as Lanawar Elves. There's a new one from Modern Horizon set, which is three Lanawar Elves stitched together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lanawar Tribe or something. Yeah, it's uh, it's like, it's, it's just, just green, three green, green. It's Elves. Yeah, it's green, green, green for a three, three Elf, and it taps for green, green, green. So, yeah, it's literally three Lanawar Elves stitched together. He'll show it on the screen, because neither, neither of us know the name. But it's, it's, that's, yeah, so Elf Tribal is definitely a humongous thing. It's probably one of the easier, Tribal in general is one of the easiest things to build just because you find a commander that cares about a particular type of creature, um, and then you basically just go Goblin and, Tribal. Oh, God, why would you mention that? You're, you're helping to mention goblins every single episode. I'm going to mention goblins every single episode. <laughs> I don't even own a goblin deck yet. Now I have to build a goblin deck. <laughs> Well, you did mention Cranko beforehand uh, with the uh, foil damp stamp. Oh, yeah, my foil uh, Cranko boy. God, it's gonna be. I mean, I, I kind of like Tin Streak though, because he's more or less like a Voltron type. Mm -hmm. um, you just boost his power yeah, and make a million power goblins. A bit, then just make a million goblins, which is gonna be hilarious. Um, Story time. I was at a friend's place. It's only 3 a.m. We're playing Commander, and I the one guy's playing this competitive Cranko deck. I'm playing, I think, Lord Wingrace. The guy next to me is playing Vile Smasher Thrasios. The Thrasios player drops Intruder Alarm. If you didn't know what Intruder Alarm does, it states creatures don't untap during your, their controller's untap phases. Whenever a creature comes into play, untap all creatures. Now, Krenko Mob Boss says tap, add a number of goblins equal to the number of goblins you control. So Krenko tapped, made a goblin, untapped, tapped again, made two goblins, made three goblins, untapped, tap again. He did that and made a million goblins. Who knows? <laughs> and then we all lost. Because he had goblin bombardment. Yeah, Intruder Alarm is one of those cards that's, um, you know, it's like two in the blue or something like that. Whatever. It's, it's definitely, you're putting it in your deck as a way of either stopping your opponents from either attacking or anything in that sense, or just basically doing that where just comboing into Oblivion um, and beyond, literally, because it just, yes. you, you run out of tokens in the entire world at that point, um, and just gets really, really crazy, really, really fast, um, uh, but that's the cool thing about tribal, is the fact of, like, you know, you can do a little tribal synergy, stuff like that, things like that, 
Um, and like I said, it's not really that hard to actually kind of put the travel deck together. It's probably the easiest thing to actually do. Oh yeah, that's why I own two of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, we're going to actually talk about tokens. Um, and for a token section, we decided to put down Imar, Soul of the Accord, Reese the Redeemed, Gulkalar Gissa, Prash, Sky Raider of Kyr. Yeah, so... Tokens, for the most part, a lot of these guys actually want to create a bunch of tokens all at once. Um, mm -hmm. Imar, for instance, you just simply tap her, regardless of how she becomes tapped, and she creates a 1-1 like, one, one soldier. Oh, yeah. Crew a vehicle, uh, stupid enchantment that lets you tap down everyone else's stuff if you tap creatures. Oh, my God. You're so uh, angry about Glare of so dual. Tapping, tapping creatures to get mana. No more mana burn, so that's not an issue. Uh, Paradise Mantle, really good card. In Paradise Mantle. Just because you can equip it for... It comes out as a zero drop, you can equip it for one, and then you can now tap her to create mana. Um, that mana, by the way, just it kind of just sits inside. <laughs> yeah. I just held up uh, two Paradise Mantles that I have sitting out. Why do no you have reason. two Paradise Mantles? One from a Chaos Draft, one that I bought online when I couldn't find the one from the Chaos, Chaos Draft. Draft. Yeah, so you know, regardless of how she becomes tapped, she actually creates a actual token for the most part. Reese the Redeem is probably one of the more famous token makers that there ever is for the most part, just because he's a one-drop. He comes, he is, uh, so Reese the Redeem is a single Selesnia, um for a 1-1 one, one Elf Warrior, and he says two and pay either and pay a Selesnia to tap him and then put a 1-1 one, one green and white Elf creature onto the battlefield. Or, and then you can pay four and then two Selesnia to tap them. Um, for each creature token you control, put a token into play, it's a copy of that creature. So literally, Reese comes down on turn one, mm -hmm. and then by turn three, if you haven't ramped it, you're just playing, you know, normally, like a non-green player typically does, mm -hmm. um, you're then tapping him, and then you're creating another additional token. And then, at that, from that point on, you can basically just pay six tap him and you're creating like you know two tokens into four tokens into eight tokens and it gets really really crazy really really fast reese is definitely one of those token deck based decks that if you see him on the opponent's side of the field you kill um, you kill him you kill him on sight like He's that's done. just how it works There's a lot of cards we're going to talk about um today are just going to be straight kill on sights um yep. just because they have to be gone otherwise you're most likely going to lose that game um another one of those cards is typically one of those kill on sights or never let it resolve is prosh Sky Raider uh, of Care. Super, super fun card for the Mahos. Oh, yes. It is in my favorite color con combination, Jund, or Black, Green, Red. It is a 5-5 five, five legendary creature dragon for 3 Black, Green, Red. Flying, and when you cast Prosh, Sky Raider of Care, create X-01 Cabald creature tokens named Cabalds of Care Keep, I gotta love some alliteration, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast Prosh. He also has Sacrifice Another Creature, Prosh gets plus one, plus oh until end of turn. AKA, the first time you cast him, you get five creatures. The second time you cast him, you get seven creatures. The third, you nine. Get nine creatures. And, and it just it just snowballs from there. Um, gotta love Wizards of the Coast. Gotta love Wizards of the Coast. Um, I wanna pretty, get that on like a, like a board... Like, do some wood burning and just get, gotta love oh, Wizards of the Coast. Coast. Just Watsy. <laughs> and I believe this is, next one is my territory. We will be talking about Lands Matter. This, like my feature deck, Lord Wind Grace, uh, the Gitrog Monster, Titania Protector of Argoth, and Omnath Locus of Rage. I really like Titania because the second she enters the battlefield, you return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield. I actually run her in my Lord Wingrace deck. And whenever a land is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you get a 5-3 elemental. That's a lot of power. And she's a 5-3 on her own. Is she a 5-3? She's a 5-3 on her own. What the crap? For 3 and 2 green. With, yeah, and plus, whenever a land you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you just create the actual 5-3. So, yeah. let's take, I don't know, fetch lands. Let's take evolving wilds. Now get you a 5-3. Let's take Zoran Orb. Zero mana. Pay zero mana. Sack a land. Gain two life. Ta-da. Pay zero mana. Gain two life. Create a 5-3. Like, basically instant speed, basically all the time. It's just, it gets really, really crazy. Oh, yeah. Pair that with the next card, the, the, the last card that I mentioned, Omnath, Locus of Rage. He is an elemental. He's a 5-5 five, five for 3, 2 red, 2 green, and has a landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your your control, 
Put a 5-5 five, five red and green elemental creature token onto the battlefield. Whenever Omnath, Locus of Rage, or another elemental you control dies, Omnath deals 3 damage to target creature or player. You do not know how many games I've won by playing Titania, playing Omnath, sacking a bunch of lands, recurring a bunch of lands, and then just board wiping and beaming my opponents down with elemental rage. Not even that, just the... There's... And the fact they're all inside of a lower ring grade circus like that sense, so the simple com the simplest of combos, I'm pretty sure RJ can go in much more detail with it, but the simplest of combos even I can see is um, with Lord Wing Grace, you minus three Lord Wing Grace to return two target land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So I'm not on the field, so then you just get two triggers of him, you get two five five elementals. Yep. Let's say those lands that you brought back are you know, a fetch land or an evolving wild. Or even, yeah, the base is a fetch land and evolving wild. Mm -hmm. You're then now sacking both of those, pretty much ignoring the triggers if you want, um, putting them both into the graveyard, and then it triggers Titania. Who or then gives you, you a... could just use those fetch lands, get more lands, get two more Omnath tokens. Those lands go to the graveyard, get two elementals from Titania. Titania. And more importantly, Omnath doesn't care about the elemental that gets destroyed in the sense of the color or anything in that sense. So mm -hmm. as long as you're creating elementals, he cares about that. Oh, yeah. Um, creates elementals. One, uh, I actually took this card out. There is um, Sylvan Awakening. It is two and a green and says all your lands become zero two elementals oh, with no. indestructible reach and haste. And they're like that until the end of the of your next turn or end of the next turn. And you just, you cast that, you turn your 30 lands that you're obviously playing in Lord Wingrace into elementals, and you Sap sacrifice. Them all through the orb, and then, yeah, it basically just pings everyone down instantly and just... Mm -hmm. Or you can Toxic Deluge for two life, and wipe and all of them out. Yeah, because that gives minus one, minus one counters onto them, or doesn't it, it doesn't give counters, but it gives them minus one, minus one for the most part, which will get around the indestructibility of them. For the most part, it's, it's actually just crazy, it's absolutely just nutty. Um, but that's the reason why land, <laughs> lands matter decks are just kind of like that. Um, speaking of indestructibility, let's talk about my favorite one, um, or at least the one that I know most about, which is Voltron. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just for the Voltron PTSD the of SRAM punching yes. me in the face over and over again. So the Voltron strategy, for the most part, we're actually going to mention SRAM Senior Edifester, Sigarder Host of Heralds, Bruna Light of Alabasta, and Rafik of the Many. The reason I'm mentioning these Rafiki. is... Rafiki! Really nice. <laughs> the reason I'm mentioning these for the most part is the fact that Voltron has a double-edged sword because you can either go into full-on equipments and everything in that sense, like, you know, gives it trample or, like, you know, give it... Like, you know, flample? Flample, which is basically flying and trample, um, or give it, like, you know, double strikes stuff in that sense. Or you can switch over like Bruno kind of wants to do, which is giving it a bunch of enchantments. So kind of putting stuff onto it and stuff like that sense, where it actually will gain these abilities because of the actual enchantments. Typically, mm -hmm. the enchantment route is stronger than the equipments, mainly because enchantments inherently are stronger than equipments. Oh, yeah, but it's dangerous. Mainly dangerous because the one downside of having an enchantment-based creature is the fact that once the creature goes away, so do all of your enchantments. Um, at the very least, if they kill someone with an, with an artifact, you'll at least be able to, you know, really equip that artifact onto something else. Plus, the one thing about the artifacts, which is the reason why I like SRAM so much, is because when an artifact or, or equipment um, or a vehicle actually enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card when SRAM's on the field. Yeah. That is crazy, especially in Mono White. Just it's because... Just the way that... Aaron's SRAM deck is built. It's every card he plays, he draws a card. Yeah, it's 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 great. Like, you know, it's just like cool. So like, you know, SRAM's on the field, some assets, whatever, let's just put out, you know, throwing dagger, draw a card. You know, short sword, draw a card. Um, fire shrieker, draw a card. You know, it's 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 amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And because your hand is always typically gonna have seven cards in it or something like that, so it's very, very, very close to it. This way you're not gonna have to worry about card draw in it. Yeah. Um, and if someone decides to like, you know, kill SRAM or something of that sense, I've always can equip the items onto something else. The main objective of a Voltron deck is to get to twenty one damage, not 40 because mm -hmm. 21 in damage from your opponent's commander you die yeah that is that stems from 
the old name for commander known as EDH, which is Elder Dragon Highlander. The original commanders were the Elder Dragons. Uh, Nicobolas, Arcades, Chromats, and... No, there's a, there's a few more, I think. Uh, oh, oh, what's her, what's her name? Uh, well, Nicobolas is Palladia Moors. Um... But the old Elder Dragons, for the most part, had seven power and seven toughness. Which meant that when they actually created ADA, so they're like, you know what, three hits from this dragon, and let's just say that you die. Like, you know, something yeah. passes to kind of speed the game up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how It prevents we got... infinite life gain from being the only strategy plausible. Exactly. Like, for instance, like, you know, my Amara deck with the tokens, those tokens that Amara creates has lifelink. It got to a point, or it does get to a point, that I can have over 200 life. I've done that before, RJ. I've seen that. I've seen that before. <laughs> it's totally um, my favorite thing in the world, versing 200 life. Because my 2020 flyer is not really that ex uh, exciting when my opponent has 10 times the number of life. Yeah, you know that you're you know that you're having a good time when someone swings, like, you know, a 30-30 at you, and you're just like, I'll just eat the damage. Like, that's... You know you're having a good time at that point. <laughs> do you have Sarah Avatar in, in that deck? What does Sarah Avatar do? Sarah Avatar, I don't remember the mana cost. I believe it's three and a white. And it's power and it's a... I don't think it has trample. But oh, yeah, no, I do know that one. It's, uh, it's, it's three... It's expensive. It's like three white, white, whites. Um, and mm -hmm. its power is equal to number... Or equal to your uh, life total. Life total. Um, I don't have it in the Amara deck, but I should put it in SRAM. Because it'll be a great creature just equipped and just swing. Because you, like... The downside with Sarah Avatar is that it it only it just has that one just has it's just a big creature mm -hmm. which is cool but it doesn't have flying it doesn't have trample it doesn't have anything crazy that you actually want to have, have for a creature like that to hit and make sure it gets through. Putting it inside of Shram, I can give it trample with like you know the Loxodon Warhammer. I can give Dove Strike with a Fire Shrieker. Um, I can give it flights with uh, Orange Sarah's wings mm -hmm. and just yeah. I, 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 where is my Sarah Avatar? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really, really just need to go find that card. Another one of my specialties, being the Lord Windgrace player, is Graveyard slash Dredge. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a new one coming in the new set, uh, Hogak. When I saw the spoiler for Hogak, Arisen Necropolis, all I thought was, let's build a Dredge deck. So I did. Uh, Muldrotha the Gravetide, another fantastic Graveyard Commander. You, with her, you can play any number, well not any number, you can play one of each permanent type from your graveyard each of your turns. Marin, Clan of Neltoth, uh, two a black and a green. She, her ability is incredible. I want to get her for Lord Windgrace. Whenever a creature you control dies, you get an experience counter. And with Proliferate, you can increase those experience counters. And the beginning of your upkeep, or no, beginning of your end step, you can choose a creature card in your graveyard and if that card's converted mana cost is less than the number of experience counters, you can return it to the battlefield. And I also do want to mention, just chime in for a second, and just mention that experience counters is something that came out in a commander set, I believe it was 2016 um, or so, that states, it's kind of one of those things that it's, you can't touch it, you can't interact with it for the most part, at least your opponents can't. Mm -hmm. um, experience counters are on the player themselves. So for instance, if RJ was actually playing Marin, he himself would have 13 experience counters. But I can't say, like, you know, okay, well, I'm going to drain those 13 counters from you. I'm going to force you to, like, you know, sacrifice them or something. That there is um, the new spell. It has Liliana on it. It's a common. Yeah, It's, like, actually... one black. And I think it removes counters from players. If it says players, it's on the screen right now. If it says players, awesome. If it doesn't, if it it's going to be a picture of me in a dunce cap. It's basically going to how that's going to work out. Because yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think it actually... I know it removes it from basically any permanence, so that always kind of can save you some ass. Like, you know, like, if, for instance, actually, you know, because the, um, I was thinking about your Merit Lodge thing, that's not gonna, that's not gonna matter, because once it becomes a creature, it doesn't have any counters on it, so that doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Um, but, like, you know, there are definitely removes counters from, like, a bunch of other things, but I'm not sure if it removes it from players. If it does, then yes, it should potentially work for the experience counters, but outside of that, experience counters are kind of just there, and you can't really do anything about it. The best option, for the most part, is basically just to kill the player, or make sure that he can't get experience counters any way possible. Um, rather it be like, you know, killing his creature, or in this case, not killing his creature. Um, 
because then you could just go crazy with it. Um, I really, really like Marin. I like the theory of it. And as much as I'm dumpstering on experience counters, I really like the mechanic of them just because it kind of puts a clock on the entire table it, yeah. where you have to kind of really decide, okay, am I going to deal with you now while you've only got like you know, two counters on it or am I going to have to deal with you later on? Like, you know, how big or how crazy can your deck truly, truly become? Oh, yeah. Um, with any of those, uh, the combos with Omnath earlier, sacking those... Uh, Elementals, Elementals and just dumping experience counters on yourself, and then beginning of your next turn, just getting whatever back. Yeah, it's it, it can get really, 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 really crazy. Um, and just Great Red Shenanigans in general are just fantastic, just because... If, like, take Mildrotha, for instance. Mildrotha is a three black, green, blue for a legendary creature elemental avatar uh, for a 6-6. Six, six. And it says, during each of your turns, you may play, keep your thirst play, up to one permanent card of each permanent type from your graveyard. Permanent types are lands, artifacts, enchantments. Planeswalkers. Planeswalkers. You really creatures. forgot planeswalkers? We're the planeswalkers pub. <laughs> I know. I froze. I'm sorry. Planeswalkers, um, creatures, and basically just artifacts for the most part. And it's one of those things that... Mojovo is probably one of the most scariest commanders I've ever faced. And I've faced a decent amount of them. Oh, yeah. Um, my friend ran a Cranko deck and he did the whole infinite combo like you just mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's one of those things that Mojovo is... I see Mojovo in the enemy side of the table or something. I'm targeting that player until they die. That's just how it works out. It's nothing, oh, yeah. against, it's nothing against you. It's nothing against you. I mean, I'm not afraid of that, but that's because my best deck's Lord Wingrace and I'll just recur a Bajuka Bog exactly. till the end of time. Like, you know, I don't... I like Great Bird Shenanigans. I'm not really a fan of throwing stuff out in general just because, I don't know, I'm a hoarder, I guess. Yeah, um, he is. He really is. <laughs> no, don't play that card in your dredge deck. You're throwing too many cards in your graveyard. Oh my god. Like, really. This man does not know what he's talking about. Let it go. But anyway, Mojotha is definitely, definitely scary. Um, dredge as a whole is a really, really cool mechanic that basically states that if you don't want to draw a card, you can instead dredge x which is the number on the card so let's say dredge three for instance mm -hmm. and then you actually put three cards from the top of your library into your graveyard and then draw that card that you dredged with oh yeah life from the loam yeah it's one of those things that it's it can get really, really dangerous and plus something that i didn't realize until rj actually used it against me it gets around um smother's tire which I didn't realize. Yeah, no, um, I'm not drawing cards, so you don't get any counters. Exactly. You, you don't it's, get any treasure. It's, it's really, really crazy. It gets around a bunch of different stuff where it's like whenever your opponent draws a card, you draw two. So, for instance, it gets around class greatest ranks because you're not technically drawing a card. Yeah. You're just putting a card from your graveyard into your hand. It's a replacement effect type deal. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic, and Dredge is just definitely one of those cooler mechanics, and just Graveyard Shenanigans in general is a cooler mechanic. Um, side notes... What's that card we saw? It was in white. Um, something that stops all of that nonsense. <laughs> oh god, there's a million of them. Uh, the... Well, Silent Gravestone will actually stop Muldrotha, because she's physically targeting those cards themselves. Yeah, um, there's um, Rest in Peace. That's what I was mentioning, yeah. Rest in Peace basically just like, you know, if someone's going to, if you're going to get someone that has like, you know, a lot of dredge or a lot of like graveyard recursion stuff, Rest in Peace will basically just literally put them out of the entire game because they have to get rid of it otherwise they can't play their deck our next actual thing is going to be walls so this is kind of my territory again which is kind of nice they're bouncing back and forth a little bit um i honestly did not design it like that but it just kind of happened um so we're going to be talking about arcadius the strategist as well as doran the siege tower so doran for the most part was the only actual commander that dealt with um toughness matters um where it actually gave the ability to, it is a black, white, green, um, not in a particular order, uh, for a tree folk shaman, it's a zero five. And each creature assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. So a couple of things with this. Number one, it doesn't care about walls in the sense that it makes them attack. So you can't attack with them. You can't attack with them or anything like that, which does kind of suck. However, you're going to put a lot of stuff that has like you know a lot bigger toughness than power because you don't want this on the field. It's going to switch around anyway. Oh yeah, and they you'll be uh, able to do some work. The dinosaur from Ixalan, three and a white. It's a one seven. Oh god, no. <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh no. It's a one seven for four mana. So and then AKA. when he's on the field, it basically becomes a seven seven. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that can get. Yeah, that can get. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, the downside of this, or an upside depending on how you look at it, is the fact that when he's on the field, it says each creature. 
That includes your opponent's creatures, too. Um, oh, which basically can flip the script a little bit. Sometimes it can help you because your opponents aren't expecting that. Like, you know, their two one or something, that's is now a one two. Mm. Or, like, you know, their zero three or something in that sense or whatever just becomes a lot stronger because yeah. now it's a three three. But it's one of those things that a lot of people were excited about it because, like, you know, just choosing, making it, it just changes up the game, changes up how you kind of want to do your strategy and build your strategy in that sense. And then Arcadis came out and said, hey, all those walls that you might have lying around or that you consider useless, I now make them basically immortal. And it's kind of great. Um, it turns stuff like, you know, there's a new wall that actually came out. It's like Wall of Shards um, or Wall of Spear Swords, I think. Well, I think that was a reprint. It's definitely a reprint. I don't remember what the name is. It's like Wall of Swords or Wall of a Thousand or Wall of a Thousand, thousand Cuts. A thousand, wall of a Thousand Cuts, yes. yes. Um, it's flyer, too. Yeah, which is great. Um, one cool thing about the walls in general, um, A, I can talk about walls all day, I might make an actual episode about it in case you guys actually like it, hit us up in the comments, um, but walls are really cool because they're two things, they're cheap in the sense of actual money cost, they're only like maybe like 10 cents or like oh, yeah. cents. the most expensive because wall is probably like $2. The only um, walls that, the only people who run walls are people who play wall decks. Yes, or even stuff like, you know, little walls that you don't even notice are walls, like for instance, Fog Bank is a wall that most people kind of run because it's like, you know, it's a two and a blue and it basically, is, for a zero two, it basically states like, you know, that it takes no battle damage. Yeah. Um, or just, yeah, no, basically no combat damage for the most part. It's a decent blocker. Most walls are basically utilized just for the blocking aspect of mm -hmm. it. Like, you know, attacking into a zero three or even like, you know, a one six or something or a um, zero seven, it can yeah, get Yeah, wall of enough. frost. Like, wall of frost. Great. Three mana for a zero seven that now is a seven seven. It's a great, great card even by itself. Just because, like, you know, there's no point... Like, if you've got, like, you know, 2-2 two -two or something like that says, there's no point attacking into a 0-7 because you're not going to get through. Who cares? So you're not going to bother. With Arcades on the field, that 0-7 becomes a 7-7 seven -seven and can now attack you. Like, it is... Believe me, people... People have versed me with my actual Arcades deck. I've versed my Arcades deck myself when I give it to someone else. It's terrifying. It's... Mm -hmm. it's you have this very humbling feeling of, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. I, I took back... What was it? Three or four turns... Last night, trying to figure out a way out of the death. That it was yeah, coming. yeah. <laughs> I was at six life. He had two zero threes, and I'm just like, okay, I don't have any destruction spells. I can't cast anything else from my graveyard. I could bring my commander back out. Not going to do anything. Doesn't have reach. Uh, nothing I could do. Yeah, and it's even better because most walls have like defensible abilities. Like you know, they'll give it flying or something. That's where they'll give it reach. They'll give it like you know. Um, there's this one wall, whatever, I think it's like two green and a blue um, that basically says it has shroud. Like, giving a wall shroud doesn't seem like much for the most part, but once you put it in our case, it's, it's now like an 8-8 eight, eight with shroud and flying. That's not a good time. That's, <laughs> that's not a good time at all. Um, but walls are really fantastic. I love them to death, and I'm thankful every single day that our case was ever created just because he's the fit, most fantastic commander I've ever actually played. Onward to sacrifice deck. There are a card featured in my Golgari deck, Savra, Queen of the Golgari. Two, a black and a green, legendary creature, elf shaman, two, two. None of that matters. Whenever you sack a black creature, pay two life. Each opponent sacks a creature. Whenever you sack a green creature, gain two life. You sack a Golgari creature, each opponent sacks a creature. That's just what that means. Then we have Mazarek, Crawl Death Priest. And whenever a player uh, sacrifices another creature... Put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So whenever someone sacks something, you're just bumping up your creatures. Then you have Throximunda. I don't know if that's how you say it. just sounded no, cool. That's basically exactly how I said it, too. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, four Grixis, or four blue, black, red. For a legendary creature, Zombie Assassin. He's a 6-6 six, six with haste. Come on. Uh, whenever Throximandor... Uh, attacks, defending player, sacrifices a creature. And whenever a player sacrifices a creature, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on Thraxamundar. Now, fun fact, when I was actually making up this um, outline, everything in that sense, whatever, I was kind of just searching around, looking for commanders and stuff like that to kind of um, talk about. I ran into Thraxamundar um, just because, A, his name, is, his name is just awesome. He's going to be on this list regardless. Mm -hmm. But his effect alone is 
pretty terrifying. Plus the art. I mean, look at that art. It's it's glorious. Oh, yes. Um, I don't sort of sure what it is, but it's just it looks like some stuff is going down. Um, I also want to mention my book. His flavor text is probably really, really great. Uh, Arjun, want to read that out for us? Ooh. His name means he who paints the earth red. Come on! <laughs> just come on. It's That's amazing. Beautiful. Um, I also want to mention, by the way, that with him, he's definitely another card where you can run it as a Voltron strategy, which kind of makes sense. Um, even a plus one plus one counter strategy, or even just running him by himself as the commander itself, just because whenever he attacks the defending player, so like, you know, I attack RJ with him or something like that, says, RJ now has to sacrifice a creature. That's before blocks. And when RJ sacks that creature, I put a plus one plus one counter on him. Also, before blocks. So yeah. now he's a 7-7 seven, seven before blocks. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go to blocks and whatever. If he's got, he doesn't have trample inherently, but if you give him trample or whatever, this is your commander. Once again, we're right back to that same principle with, e, with you know, the original EDH rules hitting that 21 commander damage. He becomes an Elder Dragon at that point with the 7-7 seven, seven, just yeah. straight the gate. And it doesn't, it goes away if he leaves, obviously, but he can then turn around and attack someone else. They then have to sacrifice a creature. You know, it just, it gets crazy because... He's a Voltron commander that kills other Voltron decks. He does, actually. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> because if for Voltron I need to build a Thraxamundar deck. It's a good card, right? It's a really I'm super happy that I found this. It's it's a it's a really good card. Now here's a downside. He is seven mana. Yeah. That's 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 pretty steep. He's only two less than the Air Dragon, the most broken card ever printed. Basically. He is seven mana, which is kind of steep. And then like you know when he dies, because he will be getting killed, I assure you um, he now costs 9 mana, and then 11, and then you can do math from there. Oh, yeah. It's, he's going to... Or if you're like me, and you can't do math at all. <laughs> he gets really, really expensive really, really quickly. So it's one of those things that you kind of want to, like, you know, toss him out there, give him Shroud or something like that, since give him Hexproof. Um, the cards are directly on screen. We all know the boots. Just to protect him a little bit, but he seems like a lot of fun. Like, yeah. A, a dumb amount of fun. And he's in um, Nicol Bolas colors, so you can run all the Nicol Bolas Planeswalkers. Oh, why would you say that? Now I'm going to build this. Dang it, dang it. The next one on the list is Spell Slingers. Uh, Spell Slingers, for the most part, is basically just stating that these are the decks that want to, sp- to play a lot of spells all at once, or at the very least, a lot of spells in a single turn. Number one on that list is Feather the Redeemed. Uh, Riku of Two Reflections. Mythics of the Is Magnus. And Vile Smasher. So Vile Smasher is definitely one of my favorites. I definitely want to talk about the first. I'm gonna. Why are you grinning on Vile Smasher? I don't like Vile. I played one on one versus Vile Smasher. Technically illegal, you but you... no, because Vile Smasher can be your commander by himself. No, he is an illegal one v. He's illegal in one v one commander. Seriously? Yep, he's banned in one v one commander. Th- throw it up on screen. I, I need proof. He throw is. It up on I... <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll do it. Um, but yeah, no, because he is. His ability states whenever you cast your first spell each turn, each turn, which means your opponent's turn too, Vile Smasher the Fierce deals damage equal to that spell's converted mana cost to an opponent uh, at chosen random. at random. So then, yeah, I guess... In one-on-one, yeah, you're just burning your opponent for every turn. You're just targeting your opponent exactly. That, that, all right, that totally makes sense at that point. Therefore, why he'd be banned at one v one But even still, Vile Smasher is definitely a really, really cool card because he has this cool mechanic, which I really hope they bring back, um, called Partner. Oh, um, yeah. Which states that you can have two commanders um, if each one of them has partners. So typically you combine Vile Smasher with Thrasios, mm-hmm. uh, just because it gives you additional colors that you don't normally have in uh, Rakdos. Um, like, you know, giving Rakdos the ability to access blue, not great. I don't recommend it. Um, pretty crazy. <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. And then it also has the ability to activate with green because you're combining it with, like, you know, Thrasios or something, or whatever. That's now giving it the ramp that it needs and the counter spells that it wants with, uh, with not taking away any of the actual power that it already has, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, switching back over real quick to just Feather the Redeemed. It's a red, white, white for a legendary creature angel. It's a 3-4 um, with flying, as most angels have. Uh, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets a creature you control, exile that card instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Let's... I hate playing against Feather. Oh my god, high five in the Ugh. air. Woo! Lord, I'm never building Feather, I'm never playing against Feather, I hate Feather. So... It's just, 
I play this one cent instant card that lets me draw a card. I just drew seven cards. I'm going to do it again and again and again every single turn on the opponent's turns. Um, now, here's the thing. We're hating on Feather for one specific reason. Because our friend Eric has a Feather deck. He's... And he plays a Feather deck. And it's a very good deck. It's a very good it's deck. It's a very, very good deck. And don't get me wrong, and I'm putting up, like, you know, right on the screen right now, two of the pub rules. Like, you know, number one is, yes, Salt does transition from game to game. And <clears> number two is... If you see this person first, you kill them. Um, this kind of goes on with the same principle with like you know rule pub rule number six six six, where if there's someone's playing slivers, you kill them first. Mm -hmm. This is now no rule number thirty two, where if someone's playing feather, you kill them first. Yes. Um, just because feather is one of those commander decks that it's durable. It's dur it's more than just durable. It's and I, I typically I feel bad for killing someone first, or whatever. If, if I've got no legitimate reason other than your deck is very powerful, because it's kind of a, a no duh type situation. Um, but it's one of those things that with feather it becomes unbeatable after literally three turns. It just does because mm -hmm. all every single card in their deck, outside of it being a land, is going to be a cantrip or a very very cheap instant spell, um, or even just a decently cheap sorcery spell. Like, you know, something in Assassin's Creed, very few board bucks too. But that's besides the point. The point is, it's a Voltron Eve style deck that has the ability to just spit out a dumb, dumb amount of potential. Um, just because any any spell, like, that says targets two creatures or something in Assassin's or whatever, or even just you're targeting, like, you know, one creature, um, you're always going to target Feather with it, or you're going to target a creature you control, and then it bounces it, it exiles it for starters, just so you can't even interact with it, and then it goes right back to your hand after, so you can use it on your opponent's turn. Um, there's a card, uh, it's a one drop, I think it's for a red, um, I'll put it up on screen right now, that states, uh, that when you cast this, you ping something for a red, or you ping something for one, and you just draw a card. Um, Eric used this on his turn, and then on RJ's turn, and then on my turn, and then on Steve's turn. And then he went back to his turn, and he's back on his turn, he now drew four cards. Yeah. Like, and the card itself is still in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dumb... Dumb deck. It's extremely powerful, um, and it's kind of hard to deal with. I've versed this with a bunch of my different decks. Um, I've used Imara to try to actually reverse it. Nothing. I've used like you know Tesa to try to do it. I'm too slow with it. Um, like you know Voltron doesn't work because they can just you can just ping it down. Just it's the deck is fast. Yeah. And it's kind of weird that how fast it is because it's in Boros colors. How did Aminatu deal against? do against it i don't want to bring amy into this <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> here's the, here's the, because, because amy i bring out i'm not to um i'm not to is my planeswalker deck she's on this list needless to say but she's on it for a different reason um i not to is my planeswalker deck and she is also the strongest deck i currently own um taste is getting up there in power level but that's the point um she's currently the strongest deck i, I own if i'm bringing out i'm not to for your deck please understand that's that's a courtesy to both you and me because it's proving that I don't have anything strong enough to deal with your deck currently. So I have to bring out this in order to compare, in order to make myself feel better for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel bad for comboing off when I know that your deck is equally as powerful. I don't want to bring out Minato into this because I don't want her to lose. <laughs> it's more of a pride thing than anything else. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, I just wanted you to say it for all the, all no, the people no, no, listening. No, it's, no, no, no. It's, it's for the microphone. Like, you know, hi, my name is Aaron Williams. I'm not being goaded into this at all. I don't want Chris Feather the Redeem because I'm afraid she will. That is all. I um, Lord Wingrace has lost a lot of games. He's my strongest deck, but I don't mind losing anymore. Well, it's because Feather. There's really no answers to it. Um, the best way of actually answering Feather isn't to counterspell the the stuff that he's playing. It's to counterspell Feather itself. That's the kick. Make sure that Feather never hits the field, and when it oh, does, yeah, it dies immediately. They're playing Boros. You just gotta keep. Um... Keep, bur keep burning her. Keep, keep getting rid of her. Yeah. There's no ramp in Boros. Well, they're smothering type now, which is amazing. Yes, but, but they're, it's, it's, they're going to have a hard time getting out Feather if you keep exactly. getting rid of her. You have to just you kill Feather, keep killing it, over and over and over again. Yes, they're gonna, yes you're going to feel bad. Or even, um, what's that, um, it's a white enchantment that states, uh, when it comes in, you, call, you name a creature a card, and they can't, you name a card, and they can't play that card. Um, well, there's a bunch of different things, like a Pithing Needle. Uh, that would be great. See, if I run Pithy, that'd be... That, see, that's... That's, that's the, mean. <laughs> Pithy is a mean card. Well, that's another thing, too. It's the fact that, like, that's the only doubt... I feel that's the only way of actually taking out Feather is actually just 
preventing him from playing it from the gates. Like, if he can't play Federer, then the rest of his entire deck's falls apart. Yeah. But that's kind of also one of the things where it's like, that you feel like a jerk doing it. <laughs> because you're like, you know what, that's, I'm stopping you from playing Magic. And that's something that I rarely ever, ever want to go ahead and just do. All right. Continuing with Mill decks. Mill is an interesting deck archetype in Commander because... When you're playing standard, you're playing a 60-card deck. When you're playing in a draft or a pre-release, it tends to be a 40-card deck. But Mill and Commander, it's a 100-card deck. It is really hard to... It can be it can be really hard to mill out your opponent in Commander. In exactly. a multiplayer format, it's even harder. Because most mill only targets... Or One most person. of the good mill only targets a single player. Exactly. Um, there are some mill cards that target, like, you know, each player, some assets, whatever. Um, those are on screen right now. Um, that target, like, you know, each player discards or something, assets or whatever. Or, like, you know, your opponent's discarded whenever something happens. And the thing about the mill deck, no one ever likes to get milled. Even no. Even the, the, the dredge player or the graveyard player, they like to get milled, but not to the point that you want to do it. Because they, they themselves can't keep their plan in motion. <laughs> Because of it. Um, one of the most famous mill cards for the most part is Una, Queen of the Fae. Yes. She is three Demir, Demir, Demir. Black or blue, black or blue, black or blue. Uh, legendary creature, fairy wizard. With a 5-5 five, five with flying. Not bad, but six mana, eh. I forget uh, she's flying. Yeah. <laughs> Paying X and a Demir. Choose a color. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of his or her library. For each color of the chosen color exiled this way, put a 1-1 one, one blue and black fairy rogue creature token onto the battlefield. So you know how I love me some tokens, so there's a token on the screen right now. Um, outside of that... I mean, this, this is just, you abuse it with a... You abuse it, and more importantly, it's... If you're targeting a monocolored deck, like, you know, a mono-white soldier deck, mono-white Voltron deck... Well, Voltron probably won't be the best thing, because there's a lot of colors things in there, but, you know, it's like, you know, a mono-green bear deck. Let's go with that. Sure. Um, you know... <laughs> I wonder if a bear trap this All you do is, uh... All you do is make this You play an altar, you play one of the two altars, or... Yeah, you play one of the two altars, you make a million of these, uh... You mill them out for however many, you get a couple fairies... I, all you need is just, um... You was sack the, 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 the alt, No, it's the one that, um, gives you color. Uh, Phyrexian altar? Yeah, so all you need really just... You need just two mana, for the most part. So you've got the two mana, you tap the two mana, whatever, you start the milling process, so I can, you know, like, say, like... All right, green for the mono for the mono green player. Um, they didn't mill. Even if they mill like four cards, that'll give you three fairies. You then sack two of those fairies to the actual altar. You now have two colors again. You then mention it again, and then just you just keep it going. I point. would say just use Ashnod's altar and leave a few lands open. Just mill them out. You sack Ashnod's altar for, or use the Ashnod's altar to sack a couple fairies, giving you two colorless per fairy, and then you dump those back into our ability because it's not a tap ability it's just pay x and a demir yeah and they just it so just does you it. have <laughs> four or five tapped land uh, untapped lands just do that over and over again and just continuously increasing the amount of cards you're milling mm. um milling is also one of the harder strategies to win just because as soon as people understand what your deck wants to do which is it's milling or anything in that sense or whatever um it becomes a lot harder to do it because, like I said, people don't like being milled, so they're going to automatically target you first because they're like, "I don't want to be milled because I want to keep, I want to play Magic: The Gathering." Yeah. Um. So I, that, I'm going to have to target you and I'll actually take care of you for the most part to actually take you out. And milling gets harder the more, ironically, the less people there are, the harder it is because you're targeting one person, or whatever. Like you know, I'm targeting Arthur or some of or whatever. Once he gets milled out, the other two people know that I'm going to have to target them. They're going to instantly gang up on me. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 one of the harder win cons in order to actually win with. Um, and it's only really beaten out, I guess, or hard, the only the hardest one is probably Infect. Um, which I guess we can group ahead. hug. Group hug has some shenanigans. Though. Group hug, hug has shenanigans, but the idea of group hug is to help your opponents, and then l trying to win with group hug is a little. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. group hug has some shenanigans. Yeah. It's also on this. I've list. never played group hug, so I wouldn't know. I have. It's got some shenanigans. It's 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 hilarious, and you can accidentally kill yourself, but it's got some shenanigans. Um, but we'll talk about both group hug and 
in fact, later on in this list. The next two we're actually going to talk about is kind of something simultaneously for the most part, which is going to be art and story. So it might seem like a weirder type for the most part. If those aren't really cards, what are we talking about? Yeah. So here's the thing. Magic, like I said, for the most part, actually, the cool thing about Commander is that you have the ability to play any card in Magic's history that isn't banned. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those cards are just have general beautiful art for the most part. I'm going to toss up on screen a couple of my favorites. Um, R. Gerald, let me know after this. Anything with Seth McKinnon. Literally anything with Seth McKinnon for the most part. It is just, it's it's fantastic art. A lot of people actually just built, I know there's one person actually built an entire deck just based around one particular artist. Um, just because they just liked the artwork of that particular artist. It doesn't matter if the deck is good or not. They just want to showcase all the cool art. There's a lot of fun art inside the actual pictures themselves that just look weird to the point where you're just like, this is really cool. Like, for instance, yeah. um, like, Time Twist. It's something that no people have really not seen, but it's just, it's a weird-looking card. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, my mother, she knows nothing of Magic the Gathering, but when she saw my Lord Wingrace playmat, she's like, wow, that is beautiful. And I never really thought about it. Just like, yeah, wow, they put a lot of, the artists put a lot of effort into yeah. these paint, into these drawings they put a lot painting. of time and effort into these actual things and there are people i mean even looking at our actual pod even looking at our actual like you know podcast and everything that's forever just i'm actually going to not put any pictures or any cards or anything that's up during this and i'm actually going to kind of just flood through just with the background of just a bunch of different arts that i actually particularly like and enjoy um all these are kind of just in the background of all of our videos or anything that's are going to be in the background of all of our videos and it's just kind of sitting there but Truly, just take a second and actually look at the art. Just take out, like, you know, your command deck or anything else and just kind of just glance at the art. Now, if you're not really an art person, that's totally fine. Um, maybe you're a story person. Yeah. Um, RJ mentioned beforehand the fact that there's a new Sissa coming out. Uh, yeah, Sissa, Weatherlight. Weatherlight Captain. Um, and he actually wants to build it as just a Weatherlight deck. Which yeah. is more or less just talking about the story of the Weatherlight as a whole. Yeah. You know, how it was founded, like, you know, what happened aboard it, stuff of that sense or whatever. All the different creatures aboard, different things that they encountered on the way. There are so many quotes from Miri and Cisse and Joira on all these cards. Yeah, um, even like, you know, like, like, uh, Guhar Gissa or something of that sense. She's a brother, um, and they're mentioned in a bunch of different cards or everything of that sense or whatever. They don't, you know, they're brothers, so they don't necessarily get along for the most part. Um, he's more or less into the whole science portion of it. She's more or less into the whole necromancy, so they fight, as most brothers and sisters parents do. Um, but even if you have to tell them a story of that, um, Liliana, for instance, has oh, a... Oh, yeah. So Liliana has a brother. A lot of people don't actually know that. Jotu Vess. Yeah. A lot of people don't actually know that. Um, just tell them a story of that. Yeah, um, turned him into an old zombie boy. Exactly. My favorite planeswalker of all time, outside of Amnachi because she commands it, um, is Nahiri. A, because she's a hot chick, but that's the size point. And B... Oh, poor Aaron. Poor desperate Aaron. And B... He's single, ladies. And B, because her story is actually one of slight tragedy. Um... It's not just... A lot of people just know, okay, well, that's just the chick that's fighting Soren or whatever. Like, you know, she's got, like, you know, some vampire envy. It's not that. No. Um, a brief, very brief, um, history of Nahiri, for the most part, is the fact that she was born on her own individual plane. She realized that she could actually planeswalk. This is... Nahiri and Soren are two of the original planeswalkers. Original yeah. planeswalkers weren't just given their spark, or they, they didn't just have it. They were born gods. That's just how it worked. They were born gods. Yeah. She's um, uh, from Zendikar. Yeah, she She's could just poor. planeswalk whenever she wanted. There wasn't a stipulation or anything like that. So she didn't need any power to do these things. Um, so, Ugin, the spear dragon, one of the best planeswalkers in my opinion. Um, mm, to each their own. <laughs> Ugin, the spear dragon, for the most part, actually came to Nahiri um, with Soren, I believe, because he went to Soren first. Um, came to Nahiri and was like, hey, there's these Eldrazi's. We, like, you know, we need you to kind of deal with them if you want to help us. Um, she said, fine, why not? They then took out, like, you know, Emrakul and Ulamog and Kozilek, and they then, like, They lured them to, uh, Zendikar, to Zendikar because of then, all the ma mana, yep. which is Nahiri's home plane, and sealed them in the Hedron network. Exactly. Now, the thing is, is the fact that after that, Nahiri was like, okay, well, I'll just, hold, I'll just like, you know, hold watches in my home anyway. I'll just gain watches and passes. So she slept for, like, 3,000 years. Yeah. Um, you know, but she still looks good, so that's all that matters. So, <laughs> hey, you can't stop me. I've got Nahiri playing that. It's on screen right now. Try it's glorious. It. 
Um, I'm also going to show off... Try Match.com, Aaron. I'm also going to show Try Bumble. off... Bumble. Have you seen the Ultimate Art Playmat? For uh, Nahiri? For, for Nahiri. Uh, it's the Japanese Ultimate the Art Jap- version of it. I probably. I've probably seen it a million times. It's all screen right, It's all screen right now. It's Be amazing. I want it. It's going to be great. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Nahiri eventually wakes up, swim passes, whatever, you know, because the Eldrazi get out. Or they escape mm-hmm. or something like that. Sense, they are released by Nyssa, actually. They're released by Nyssa because the Gatewatch is... Well, they're the Gatewatch. Yeah, um, they... <laughs> they're the Gatewatch. So they accidentally release it. We're not going into that. Um, but they release it, and then Nahiri kind of goes off and tries to find Sorin, or tries to find mm-hmm. Ugin, who is now missing because Nicobol's killed him. Yeah. Um, technically, it's complicated. Anyway. Yeah, um, Ugin is technically dead right now. Yeah, you have to got... wait, I think, what, three years? Two more sets? Three more Something sets? Something in that sense. Until, um, until it, Khan's... It's, it's complicated, um, mainly because... Um, it's the same principle like Teferi. Teferi's technically died like four times, but he got better. Um, so that's what's happening. Oh, my the favorite, point. Teferi. Um, so she went to go find Ugin. Ugin was dead, so he wasn't there. So then she went to go find um, Sorin. Sorin basically just kind of told her, just like, you know, just kind of go away or nothing. Like, you know, it's not really his problem because he was dealing with a bunch of other stuff. Like, oh. on. He had to deal with the uh, the vampires and humans conflicting on. Uh... Innistrad. <laughs> yeah. He had you know, he had his own problems on stuff on this Innistrad because like, you know, he had the werewolves to deal with and the humans and it's just it was a whole entire thing. Um so Nahiri then tried to fight the Eldrazi by herself, she lost. Um in the fit of rage, which is amazing, um, she actually went back to Innistrad. Oh and, yeah, she brought Emrakul to Innistrad. Well she did do that, but before that she went over to um she went over to Edgar Markov Manor and destroyed the place. Oh yeah. Um, I'm putting up cards on screen in that sense. Or Look up Soren Pissed Wall. It's an art from another uh, a, a YouTube Magic the Gathering guy, Spice Eight Rack, made this hilarious video, <laughs> and it or he's a good content creator, but he posted this picture. It's Soren Pissed Wall, and it's just Soren trapped in the walls of the manor. Yes. Um, there's a bunch of cards as well that reference it. There's a bunch of, like, you know, just arts that shows it off and everything in that sense. Um, but that's a kind of the story of it. So building a deck around that is actually pretty easy because all you really do is just, like, get, like, three different colors and you typically have the entire storyboard just right there in front of you. Oh, yeah. Um, story and arts are two types of decks that are really, really cool and interesting. Um, Mainly because I actually have an art-based deck, which is my Marchesa Black Rose deck. I'm not going to go into Marchesa because it's not important. That's what's important about the deck is the fact that every single card in there, um, deck list, by the way, is going to be in the comments, is going to be in the description below. Um, every single art card in there has a female art on it, or at the mm-hmm. very least, like, you know, it's an artifact, something like that, since forever. Um, I like it just because Marchesa in general can be a really powerful commander, but I decided to kind of limit myself by making it this. Um, in first respect, it is still a decently strong, powerful commander. It's just the fact of just limited because of this. For instance, I can't run Anger because Anger was only printed and it has a guy or a little imp thing on it. Like a, an el- isn't it an elemental? I think it is an elemental, but unless you can blatantly tell if it's a female, I don't class Does it. How do you gender an elemental? Exactly. So that's the reason why. Um, I do know technically that you can run Eldrazi in it because Eldrazi have no genders, but I feel like that's cheating. So I'm deciding not to. I can run Emrakul because Emrakul is canon to be a female. Combo decks. The new Urza. Um, that's the only one in my mind right now. I really can't even think of anything other than this new damn Urza. There's Urza, plus there's also the uh, Teferi Temporal Archmage. Um, just because when it comes out, you can untap four permanents, keep it there as permanents. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not just your Soul Rings, not just your lands. We're talking, like, you know, your Thran Dynamos. We're talking, like, you know, your Gilded Lotuses. Uh, more important, like, you know, your Thran Temple Gateways. Um, what's the thing that's not Contrast Closet? They um, want to cheat out stuff. Planar Bridge. Planar Bridge, yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about stuff like that. that don't just... forget, with this new Urza, you don't have to sack treasure tokens anymore. Yeah, treasure tokens actually just tap for green, or for blue now. Which yeah. is just dumb. Urza, it's going to be really hard. I know there's going to be people that want to, but it's going to be really hard to build it as a casual based deck. Oh yeah! Um, Everybody's a, we're just like, no, there's no way to build Urza not competitive, and they're like, well, no, maybe if you no. I mean, uh, here's the thing: there's a way of building it not competitive, but the question is, is it going to be fun for you to play? That's yeah. the thing. Like, you know, you're willingly. It's kind of like saying, "Hey, I own a car, 
and I need to be at work in 10 minutes, I'm going to willingly take the bus. Like, you're willingly putting yourself in that position just to make it seem like you're not as threatening. But here's the thing. The card itself is scary just because people don't people don't know what's in your deck unless you lately fan out your deck, in which case, what's the point of playing the deck in general? Yeah. But as soon as you see it, people have their theories in their head of what that deck can do. They're going to be scared of it. They're going to be scared of you, so you might as well go full tilt if they're going to be scared anyway. It's the yeah. same principle with the Ur Dragon, where you can technically build a group hug deck of it. You can technically do that. You can put, like, you know, all goats or all, like, very, very non... You can put shapeshifters all inside of it. Why oh, not? Yeah. They're technically dragons. They're technically dragons, sure. Yeah. Um, but people aren't going to know that until you actually play the deck a couple of times. And, like, a couple, like, five or six times. You yeah. can't do that one-time thing where it's like, okay, you've seen my deck. It's like, no, I've seen, like, 20 cards. Like, mm-hmm. I haven't seen your deck. You could be hiding the best stuff inside. You could hold, like, you know... Um, for instance, um, Katie, uh, one of our friends and RJ's sister, um, yeah. actually runs a Sahili deck. Um, oh, which is I Artifacts, which we're going to get to. Um, actually, probably next. If you haven't played against her, or she hasn't been able to hit the mana for it, you don't know she has, she has Emrakul in that deck. Oh, yeah, no. It's, it's Artifact Eldrazi. Yeah, but the thing is, when someone's looking at it, they're thinking in their head, okay, Sahili, we're thinking tokens, we're thinking artifacts, like, you know, we're thinking, you know, just build up to a bunch of mana or whatever, flood the board with a bunch of artifacts. In reality, no, I'm just putting up these artifacts in order to put up a giant Eldrazi just in your face on turn oh, four. Turn four like, Emrakul was a fun little play I did on the back. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Like, you have flat with Sram, I have flat with that. That's... Note to self. <laughs> Never flat with that. Just... I actually have this picture on there. Um, one does not simply put out a turn for Ember Cool. Okay, like that's just no. <laughs> and Trooper Joe, um, you won that game, right? Uh, did I? I'm not sure. Probably. I'm not sure either because I don't think you did. I don't think I did. <laughs> I I forget what exactly happened. I think because we were we were definitely playing four players. Um, so I think it was turn four Ember Cool, and everyone was kind of like freaked out with me as we we're taking my turn. Um, and we're just kind of like, we, we can't love it. We, no. Like, <laughs> whatever you're doing, we need you to stop doing it. Actually, no, you did win that game, because you got out the angel that doesn't make you die, and you were able to tutor for, like, we tried our best to kill you that game. Oh my god. Oh, was that the, no. That yeah, when he was right. switching, when, um, the guy with the artifacts was switching around, because he was also playing Sahili, he was also switching around. Was that, that the field. game where I got out turn for Hammer Cool? I don't think yes. so. <laughs> Well, yeah, because Turn 4 Ember Cool, then I instantly murdered it. We were playing Kingdoms, and I convinced everybody that I was the knight when I wasn't. Yeah. I was, was the barbarian. Yeah, and that was. That was, a, that was a scary fucking game. That was a fun game. Scary the king game. was infect. Scary game. Just, ugh. It's just, it's just scary, scary. Scary, scary game. Um, so we're going to go straight to infect. Number one person for infect is probably going to be Skitherex, uh, the Blight Dragon, or Skittles, as he's well known for the most part, just because it makes him sound cuter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a cute little infecty dragon. Yeah, it's a cute little 4-4 four, four flyer. Gives you little, he gives you Skittles. It's a cute little 4-4 four, four flyer. Not great. Super not great. Really? Infect is definitely another one of those things, similar to Mill, where it's a harder thing to actually accomplish um, than you would actually think. Mainly because... You only need to get 10 Infect counters onto a player, and they just die. Now, Infect is different than Commander Damage. Commander Damage, for the most part, if I hit you with my Commander, um, let's say you'll deal with... You get hit with, like, you know, 10 Commander Damage from SRAM. That's mine. Yep. Um, you get, like, you know, 10 Commander Damage from the Ur-Dragon, which is Ardrix. And then you get, like, one Commander Damage from, like, you know, Kate or, or Katie or something that's from some other creature. That technically is 21 commander damage total, or that could technically is what 21 commander damage on you. However, it's from different commanders, so it doesn't actually count towards a grand total of 21. Yeah. With infect, you have 10 infect from anyone. You are dead. Oh yeah, one thing that I was thinking an Atraxa infect deck. It's definitely something that's a lot, lot easier to actually do. Atraxa is definitely one of those things that the proliferate increases the infect counters onto you. All Atraxa needs is to hit one infect on you. And then she just sits on the board and just slowly watches you as you choke on poison. Yeah. Infect is definitely one of the scarier things to actually deal with because, A, you do see it coming. But you always need a creature up in order to block that infect creature. Otherwise, you're just... Once the ball gets rolling, it gets it gets out of control very fast because getting to 10 infect is a lot faster than taking someone down from 40 life. It's a lot faster than getting up them up to 21 commander damage. It's just... It's super fast. Um, the downside, though, or right on the upside, I guess, if you're looking at it this way, 
is the Impact player typically never wins. Um, mm-hmm. The reason being is because, similar to Mill, um, no one ever wants to be infected out. And in fact, it's a lot harder to deal with than Mill. Mill, if you've got a graveyard strategy, you know how to get some flak or something like that, or whatever, it's a lot easier to kind of deal with that. In fact, it's... People can't really deal with that that often because Infect also has a sub theme usually of Voltron where it wants to equip the creatures some essence to make them bigger or more importantly give them like you know um, Shroud so they can't be killed or unblockability. For instance, Prowler's Helm is a card that basically yeah. states that your creature can be blocked except by walls unless you're. How many it. people are playing walls other than of course Aaron? Yes, other than Arcades or the other Wall Tribal Commander we actually mentioned. Um, actually, our. Even the other guy, he doesn't even necessarily wall travel. He just he just cares about toughness. But yeah. unless you're playing Arcades or just a general wall, you're not blocking that creature. If that creature has infect like Skitherex, you're going to take four infect damage. Then you're going to take eight infect damage from the second swing. If I have to give him double strike, that's just that's just GG well played. Like you know, there's nothing you know, just double strike and then pull for pull for You're dead, my guy. Um, sorry to tell you this. One fun card, though, to run in basically any black deck, if, you could, if you've got an open slot and you just want to run something interesting, um, run Tainted Strike. It's a single black, and it states that um, target creature gains plus one, plus O, oh, and infect until end of turn. Imagine tossing out onto, like, an Emrakul. Someone's just like, okay, well, I'll just swing my Emrakul. It's like, all right, well, I'll just take it. It's like, hey, before damage, I'm going to make it, I'm going to give it infect. You're, you're dead now. Like, it's, that's been done to me. It's oh. hilarious, because you oh. don't expect it. It's an instant that... And the thing is, it's something that no one expects, because how often in Commander, honestly, do you really think about it, where you're just like, I'll just eat that damage. Like, I'll eat that eight damage. Whatever, I've got four oh. life. I'll, like, even in our last game, like, how much damage did you just take to the face because, eh, whatever, I'm, I'm at... What, how much life am I at? I'm at 28? I'll just take the seven. Like, something in that sense. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, whatever, I'll gain it back, or, like, you know, I'll just deal with this, from that sense. Um... I'll, I'll just eat the seven or whatever. Like, you know, or I'm at 40 life, someone turn four, it's ever cool, whatever. He's stringing out. I'll just take a 13 because, well, A, I've got no flyers at that point, and B, eh, I'll just take the damage. Who cares? Someone hits Tainted Strike on top of that, you just died. And it feels bad. Now, great. Feel bad. Now, great, the entire table is hilariously laughing at oh, you. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's a very, very feels bad moment because you're just like, I didn't I didn't see that coming. I, no one's playing in fact, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know how to block. Um, people that play Infect a lot, um, My will have friends. friends that naturally just block everything they do, regardless of whether playing Infect or not, because you don't, you, you can't trust them at that point. You, you can't trust them that it's not going to come and kill you. Yeah. Um, which is really, really, really hilariously fantastic. And I love it absolutely to death. After that, we'll be moving to Group Hug, something we've mentioned a little while earlier. It's strange sort of format. It's one where the main goal of group hub deck is to help out your opponent. You're trying to give your opponent good things or you're helping out the person in last place. Because if you're playing group hug, no one's going to be looking at you. They're not going to be like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Feldegriff, I need to focus on him. Yeah. That jerk. The main things in group hug for the most part, at least the main commanders that typically most group hugs have, um, are Feldegriff, uh, Zedru. Um, My favorite name ever, coming up. <laughs> Um, well, I'm actually skipping over that one in a second. Uh, Kairos, er, Kainos, and Tiro. Um, I know I butchered that, but hey, it's, it's Greek. And as well as... Angus McKenzie. Angus McKenzie. I'd like to have a beer with Angus McKenzie. He sounds like a beer type of guy, too. He does. Like, just like, just like, not really like a craft beer, just like a general, like, you know, just like... Oh, yeah, know, like, a, like, like a Guinness. Uh, yeah, or I'll like anything a... on tap, whatever, like, you know, it's just like, like it's like, like hey, like, you know, what are you drinking? I don't know, that's beer. I'm like, well, we've got this, we got that. I was like, dude... Give me a beer. Just give me a beer. I'm Angus McKenzie. Like, yeah, I'm Angus McKenzie. Just give me a beer. Let's watch um, the Eagles game. And... Look, legit. Um... Angus McKenzie, for the most part, is one of the original... I feel like... It, he's from British, Legends, isn't he? He is definitely from Legends, but he's also one of those things that... He's the original way that Stacks started. Every... Not Stacks, Group Hug. Group Hug, sorry. Um, group Hug kind of starts from... Stacks is the every, opposite of Group Hug. <laughs> Stacks is the opposite of Group Hug. Um, your Group Hug starts from... Sorry, every, I guess, thing started in one particular point or another. Like, you know, like Tokens, I believe, started with Reese. Um, with the race, they got more popular with Reese. Um, and Group Hug got more popular with Angus McKenzie just because Angus McKenzie is like, you know, one of those cards that, A, it's almost a billion dollars at this point. That's uh, $165 is what I saw. $165. The actual price is on the screen right now. It's That that just sounds just not not the greatest. That's why people run Feldegriff. 
Well, Felgraf was definitely, definitely um, a lot cheaper, which is really kind of cool. It's like five or six bucks, I think. It is definitely like five or six bucks for the most part. Um, as well as just like, you know, Kyrus and Centauro, just because they came in the Commander Precon, which yeah. is basically a Volt or a Pillow Fort style deck, um, which I do actually want to pick up in real life, but that's besides the point. Um, Angus McKenzie, for the most part, is a green, white, blue uh, for a legendary human cleric. It is a 2 2. Um, and then you pay green, white, blue, and then you tap Angus, uh, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. So. It says this turn, which means it doesn't have to be on your turn. You yeah. can fog, which basically fogs on screen right now. It's a single green to just prevent all combat that for this turn. Um, two bases fog a single combat. Like let's say someone actually swings in like you know with that Emrakul or like you know that uh, draws you with Annihilator seventeen or something in that sense. Um, well, Annihilator imagine, Annihilator yeah. doesn't matter with fog. No, it doesn't actually matter with fog, unfortunately. But at least you don't take that eleven damage. Like, True. You know, something that's whatever. At least you're not dead. Um, someone spins it, like, you know, with, like, you know, Arc- Arcades, and there's a bunch of walls that you really just can't block. Um, you kind of look over to the Angus McKenzie player, and they're just like, you know what, buddy? I'll help you out. Don't attack me next turn. Or I'll help you out, but I want you to attack him and, like, you know, kill this, kill that, kill that. Something that's in forever, and they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, anything to that, die. Um, Angus McKenzie, at that point, would then tap himself. It'll fog the entire actual thing. Believe me, I, I actually might just build an Angus McKenzie deck. <laughs> I really might. Because there's... I'm going to put up on screen... Every single fog, and it's going to take a lot of things to edit, but anyway, I'm going to put up on screen, every single fog no. that's currently in green, there's a lot of them, because I know I personally own about seven. There's, <laughs> there's like, I can think of probably three off the top of my head in white, uh, there's specific ones in green as well. Yeah, there's very specific ones in green, I know there's one with, there's one with buyback in green, we got a second of land, I believe. Yeah, Constant Mist. Yeah. Um, that one's in wind grace, because, duh. Yeah. Um, there's, there's tons of fog style effects um, which, by the way, the, the original call them fog effects because the original card is fog. Yeah. Um, this constant of fog style effects, whatever. That Angus McKenzie basically states, "Hey, no one's dealing any damage, or it's only dealing damage when I say so." And mm-hmm. more importantly, with Angus McKenzie, um, put a Seaborn Muse in there. No one deals damage ever again. Ever again. Um, typically, Seaborn Muse is definitely a staple in Angus McKenzie, just because you want to be able to react to a lot of different things. Angus McKenzie typically has a bunch of fog effects, a bunch of Staxy style effects, where it's like I'm protecting myself, or more importantly. Um, with group hug also has a sub category that we like to call pillow forts which basically means that you're putting up a bunch of different stuff that makes it hard for your opponent to either attack into you or deal with you in general the most common pillow fort items are propaganda ghostly prison and my new favorite card I'm going to choke you I know you are but I will accept the choking I hate it I know you Sphere of Safety. It is a horrible card. Oh, never buy it. Never play it. Everyone will hate it's you. It's the best. I'm going to put it on the price right on screen so you guys can buy it. TCG Player, Card Kingdom. Don't, don't buy your it. Your local card store. Don't buy it. Wherever you go, pick it up. It is the best card ever because it states that your opponent has to pay X, where X is the number of enchantments you control. So, if you have this just by itself, your opponent has to pay one generic mana to attack you with a creature. If you have this in Ghostly Prison on the field, your opponent has to pay four generic mana to attack you with a single creature. If you have this, Ghostly Prison, and Propaganda on the field, your opponent has to pay two, four, six, plus the three. (laughs) It just gets really, really crazy, really, really bonkers, and Angus McKenzie is definitely one of those decks that is going to run a bunch of enchantments anyway, so you might as well run this with it. Um, Sphere of Safety, I've, I've tutored for it many, many of times because it's one of those cards that it's just hard to deal with. Um, because most people have enchantments just inadvertently just lying around anyway. This kind of weaponizes them a little bit. Where your mm-hmm. opponent's kind of like, okay, well, what do I get rid of? I do whatever, like, you know, this. Oh, I also want to mention, now that I'm thinking about it, um, Privileged Positions is a decently expensive card in, command, in converted mana cost. Um, I believe it's, uh, like, three... It's two Selesnia, 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 and it states that oh, yeah. other permanents you control have have hexproof, which basically means that if you have that sphere of safety and propaganda and ghostly prison on the field, a sphere of safety is getting huger because of it, and b your opponent has to take out the the thing first, then to take out the sphere of safety, and the cool thing is with with Angus McKenzie, he's also in blue. RJ, what's uh what's blue known for? I'm not saying it, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So blue is known Set for yourself, damn it. Blue is known for counter spells, which means that Angus can basically say, "Hey, I'm going to fog the entire table, and then when I can't fog, I'm just going to counter." Because it gets too dangerous, something and accidents or whatever. Angus McKenzie's definitely there's a reason why he's over two hundred dollars because he does everything. Um, group hug for the most part is kind of just the deck that everyone designs at least one point in their magic career as a way of kind of just telling the whole table, hey, I don't care if I win. I just want you guys just to pop off to your heart's content. My only rule is just don't attack me. It's a simple thing. It's a simple reasoning. I'm gonna let you pop off. Plus, group hug has a bunch of different cards. Number one card in group hug decks, Howling Mind. How about very, very simple artifact? It's a two drop that says each player draws two cards on their turn. And then you draw for your normal draw step and you draw with your upkeep. Or the believe sexy door in the beginning or some essence or whatever. Um, another thing for the most part that he might actually have is it's like Well of Wishes. Well of Wishes doesn't sound right. Well it's of Wishes, one... I think, is the one that doubles your life gain. Yeah, it's the wrong one. It's, I'm thinking about the actual the blue one. Oh, that's one. Well of Lost Dreams. Yeah. The Devil's I'm, Life game. I'm thinking of the actual blue one. It's on the screen right now that basically states that, um, well, A, when it shows up, you draw two cards, which is awesome. Um, and B, um, on each player's untaps or upkeep, they draw an additional card, and then you draw additional two cards. Um, you have that plus Howling Mind on the field. Everyone's drawing three cards a turn, and you're drawing four. Like, I can pretty much guarantee you, when someone drops a Howling Mind... No one's attacking them because they're like, hey, I'm, that's awesome. You're helping me. You're lying. I get attacked with my Howling Mind all the time. That's because you play your Howling Mind and we know what you're doing. <laughs> I'm not doing it. There's no shenanigans. It's just that I need card draw. I'm playing Mono White. And in there goes the downside of Group Hug. Once someone's playing a Group Hug deck, although it might seem like it's a good thing and you're getting a bunch of value from it, you're, they're helping you out, you're really, really feeling good about yourself, you can play your deck, it's awesome. You're never getting mana screwed. It's dangerous because you've looked into a false sense of security where you're thinking in your head, okay, well, I'll, I'll deal with them later. I'll deal with them later. I'll deal with them later. But at the time that later comes, they pull it forward to the point you can't even attack them unless you're paying 12 mana. Like, for one creature. Unless you're playing a Voltron deck, you're not getting through. I'm terribly sorry to tell you this. You're, mm -hmm. you're just not. Yeah. Um, plus, they have a bunch of different tricks in their arsenal that kind of just will make it this way... It just makes it really, really hard to deal with them. Um, another card is Zedru, who I'm actually not going to go into detail with, but she um, likes to actually give away permanence. your permanents. Um, and then they, the Zedru player gets to actually draw a card and gain a life for each permanent that they gave away. Um, that can be kind of cool, but also can be really bad. There's a Liliana, not really a curse card, but it's an enchantment or whatever that states at the end of it that you lose the game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, that could run <clears throat> the Zedru deck, I believe. Um, if someone just donates that to you, guess what, my guy? You're dead. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> that is the breaks. Um, but, Group Hug, really, really cool. I love it. I love it a lot. Um, give him a Winter Orb. Yeah, give him a Winter Orb. Why not? Um, give him some, some gas. Zedru is... That can get really dangerous too. One deck of wishes I'm actually not exactly a fan of, or deck type at the very least, is called Stacks. Um, the reason why it's called Stacks for the most part is because there's an original older card called Smoke Stacks, which basically stated that a player had to pay an additional two in order to basically cast a spell or something in that sense. Smoke Stack was, uh, that one is, it has a, a soot counter on it. And at the beginning of each player's upkeep, they have to sacrifice a number of permanents equal to the no, soot counter. No, no, soot yeah, it gets. Stacks is well for starters. Stacks, let's talk about Grand Arbiter the Fourth oh. and the new Lavinia um, Azorius Renegade. So we'll talk about Grand Arbiter first, just because well, a RJ knows that one and I know that one. It's it's not great. So here's the thing. It's toxic. If you're reversing a Stacks deck, it's just it's going to be a, you're in for a very unfun game, and there's no way of flipping it around. Like there just isn't. Even yeah. if you're playing like you know someone's playing a Stacks deck, someone else is playing like you know the Angus McKenzie deck. They don't cancel each other out. Stacks wins. Yeah. That's just how it works. In the sense of, like, you know, that the detriment are put on you. So, Great Arbor, uh the fourth actually states the fact that you have to pay an additional one to cast spells, as well as creatures, and the person that has the Grand Arbiter pays two less. Yeah. That alone is just downright annoying. But then he adds on to the fact of, like, you know, just a bunch of other stuff where it's like, hey, you have to pay an additional three in order to do this, or an additional two to do that. You know, for each creature to attack, it has to do this, it has to do that. Like, you know, it just adds 
more rules on top of the already annoying rules in Magic the Gathering. And it just becomes seriously out of fun to the point where you can't even play Magic at all. Um, oh yeah, no, you just pass turn, pass turn, pass exactly. turn. Exactly, you play you know, land, pass turn, land, pass turn, land, pass turn, whatever, some assets are like, you know, it just, it's terrible. Um, ironically, for the most part, you know, they're also the same people that run Rhystic Study, because, like, you know you're not going to pay for it. Um, they'll run uh, Smothering Tithe. On their own, Smothering Tithe Rhystic Study are, they're annoying cards, but they're not that annoying. But in the Sax deck, we are already paying 12 mana to cast a 2-drop. That just adds additional crap where you're just like, I'm not paying that. What's the point of paying that? I'm not going to pay that. Yeah. Um, which then gives them more ammunition to then use against you. It's a, it's a lose-lose situation. The new Lavinia, for instance, isn't necessarily a stacks-based commander, but she can be built in stacks very, very easily. Um, she states the fact that a player cannot cast um, spells for more mana than they actually have. Mm -hmm. um, which basically means the fact that if you only have four mana you're not cheating out that 5-drop using your Signet, because guess oh, what? Yeah. You only have the 4 mana. You forget that if you cast a spell for free, she counters it. Anyway, that's cheating out things, just, it's just counter any suspend, which I don't really suspend, but any suspend... Well, actually, no, Planar Bridge doesn't cast either. It just puts it on the battlefield. It just puts it on the battlefield. Oh, right, good, so Planar Bridge is safe. Thank God. Oh, uh, yeah, gotta <laughs> love me some Planar Bridge. It's, it's just the fact of, in Magic, I mean, here's the thing. Just... And your next time you're going to play Magic or, or Commander in general, for the most part, look around on turn 5. That's usually rough for the time, time stuff actually goes crazy. Look around on turn 5. See how many Signets are out. See how many Artifacts are out that tap for mana, so for that sense or whatever. Now imagine if you didn't have that. That's basically what Lavinia does. She says, hey, whatever Artifacts you're running, ignore them. Because you physically can't use them, because guess what? You don't have those 6 mana, or anything in that sense or whatever. Um, you know... It just gets really, really crazy, and stacks, I'm just not a huge fan. Moving on to our final deck archetype, top slash bottom deck matters. We have ones such as Yidris, Maelstrom Wielder. Uh, a weird one, which me and Aaron have actually never seen in real life, is a Grenzo deck. Grenzo Dungeon Warden. He cares a lot about bottom of the deck. So, we're going to talk about Grenzo a lot more in depth, but first I just want to kind of just quickly breeze over Yidris. Yidris, for the most part, cares about top deck because it has a cool mechanic called Cascade. Cascade basically states that when you actually cast a creature or just a spell in general, um, you're, ca you're then revealing the top card of your library until you hit something with the CMC less than the thing that you just cast, um, which is kind of cool. So if you've got top of deck matters, basically means that you want to manipulate the top with either using Brainstorm or a Tutor or like, you know, ponder or something like that, since we're to kind of just see what's on the top. This way you can actually kind of know what's coming. Um, and he just really, really wants that because this way he can get the maximum value out of his Cascade trigger. Um, on the flip side, quite literally, yeah. uh, Grenzo Dungeon Warden is an X black red for a legendary creature, Goblin Rogue. This goblin I actually don't mind that much. Um, oh, gotta love the goblins. Gotta love the goblins. Uh, and it says that Grenzo enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters onto it. So it has that weird Hydra effect, but mm -hmm. it's slightly different because Commander Attacks gets a little weirder with him. Um, and then you can pay two generic. Uh, he's also a 2-2, by the way. You can pay two generic, put the bottom card of your library into your graveyard. If it's a creature card with power less than or equal to Grenzo's power, put it onto the battlefield. So one thing to note about right from the gate, Grenzo is a 2-2. So unlike every other Hydra, for the most part, that requires X, Grenzo doesn't have to worry about, like, you know, you can cast him on turn 2 and be fine. He's not going to just immediately die. Um, also, too, because he's got the X in his claws when you're casting him, you can make sure that you get head to him to whatever power level he actually needs. Um, and then paying 2 to put the bottom of your library into your graveyard, and if it's a creature, you get to cast it for free, is amazing. It's also a mechanic, that's the reason I put it on this list, is because bottom of the deck matters isn't something that you see ever. ever. Really. It's not, like, think about all the times where it's just like, you know, like, okay, we'll put the, like, you know, two to four card, or not even two to four card, but just like, you know, like, um, look at the top three cards of your library, and then put one to your hand, and then the rest on the bottom. Think about that. Yeah, you can put it in a, a lot of them do say random order, but you can put them in a specific order with some of them. Exactly. And most of the time when people put, like, you know, the bottom of their library, they're just like, okay, well, I don't really care. Like, you know, a couple of times, like, you know, like, even RJ and I will just, like, flip up the bottom of our deck because they're just like, you know, like, oh, like, I don't know what, like, you know, this counter spell is. Like, a little bit about that. Oh, there it is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I remember playing Omnato, it's always, like, oh, Ugin. Yeah. Moving, <laughs> moving to cheat step. Yeah, moving to cheat step, it's always just Ugin on the bottom of the library. Yep, where he belongs. <laughs> Shut up. Um, 
But yeah, it's one of those things like, you know, that with Grenzo, the bottom of the library matters a lot. Which also means you can run a couple of cooler things. Um, like, like think for instance, um, I don't remember the actual name of itself, but it's called something stylus. Like, Tell July stylus, I actually think it's called. Um, where you just tap it and then put a target card from, like, you know, your hand onto the bottom of your library. Something like that seems kind of innocuous in real life because you're like, okay, well, I just, I put it on my library, I never see it again, what's the point of that? But with Grenzo, you can cheat it out. Like, let's yeah. say that Grenzo's, like, you know, he comes in as a two drop, something like that, since whatever, and you drop Tell God Slash or whatever that is, and then you put, like, you know, something that has haste or, like, a little goblet or something that's on the bottom of your library, you then cheat that out, and... It now is on the field and it's not swinging. You know, plus, it just says pay two. Not two colors, not two, like, you know, two black, two rares, or just two generic mana. So if you've got a bunch of mana, or even just a soul ring, that's crazy. It really, really is. I really wish, well, I know why he's not, but I really wish he was in different colors. Like, you know, maybe, like, toss this on blue, maybe toss this no, on white. Mm -hmm. Okay, not blue, but toss green. some white. I would, I would toss, put some green yeah, in there. Definitely some green. Definitely some white, just because it, it opens him up a little bit more to what he can actually do. The reason why they didn't is because, let's get real, if they did, he'd be kind of broken. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe because there's, think about it this way. There's a lot of stuff that says, like, you know, target play, like, you know, you can mill from the top of your library, some assets, whatever. There's very few things that take care of the bottom of the library. There's mm -hmm. nothing you can really do about it. Yeah, nothing. The only upside is the fact of, like, you know, it is a minor graveyard strategy because you have to put the stuff into the graveyard and then it goes back to the battlefield. So if it never hits the graveyard, it never technically goes to the battlefield. So, there's some minor stuff in that sense, um, but outside of that, really, really fantastic card. I love it. Love it to death. It's, it's pretty awesome. Now, we're actually going to switch over to one of my new favorite things. It's going to be Last Call! Last Call! RJ. <laughs> Last Thoughts. Um, we talked about a lot of cool stuff today, or everything that says, whatever. Um, some stuff we actually didn't get to. What is probably your favorite, either we mentioned or that we didn't mention or anything that's it's just kind of type of deck to be playing? I feel like I'm not allowed to say Lord uh, Lands Matter, so I would probably go with uh, Group Hug, only for the fact that you can just, you can goof off with your opponents. You can laugh, you can do interesting things. It's definitely one of those archetypes where it's just like, you know you're going to have a good time. Even if you're going to like get combat out and die later on, it's, you're going to have a good time the entire time. Just, oh yeah. You know... Group Hug is one of those games that if everyone's feeling salty or from the game before, or everyone's kind of tilted, or even like two people are tilted, they're just like, I don't know, man, like, you know, let's just do one more game and I'll probably call it. You play a Group Hug deck, that instantly turns up everyone's opinions and everything in that sense. No people are like, all right, well, I guess one more won't be hurt, or anything in that sense or whatever. It's always kind of good in that sense. Group Hug is definitely one of those ones that it's fun. Um, we don't currently have a Group Hug player in our, in our play group. Mm -hmm. Um... I feel like if we pull our money together, we could probably put what deck together. That'd be decent. We're not going to get Angus McKenzie, because that just now calls the entire deck. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, cool, so budget, and there's the window. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> We're running the most basic of basic lands that we found in the garbage can because we couldn't afford the actual play lands. <laughs> so now we're not going to Angus McKenzie, so we've got no decks. Just Angus McKenzie. Just Angus McKenzie. We've got Angus McKenzie in our cell phones to represent what the cards yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> We'll print out pictures. <laughs> Every card of the prog the proxy, it's a proxy. except <laughs> Angus McKenzie. <laughs> I have a proxy uh, basic forest. Dude, it's only like two cents. Did you almost Angus McKenzie? Yeah. <laughs> we were trying to make this deck under two hundred dollars. Oh god. Um, my favorite archetype, I feel like, is probably as I'm just, just very very quickly kind of glancing over. Actually, probably Waltz. Um, just because... And this is more or less, like, similar to how you mentioned Lord Brewingers or that's where, like, you know, that's, like, your favorite deck in general. Um, Waltz is my favorite because Arcadius was my first official commander. Everyone has, like, their first commander that they actually build, which in my case was Azuri. It was terrible. It was a horrible, horrible elf deck. It just didn't work. Um, maybe because I didn't really know the mana base that well. Um, and then my actual deck, the first deck that actually worked... Was Arcadia's a strategist? I mean, my first deck was the Lord Wind Race Precon. So. Exactly. It just it just worked. It just clicked. Um, Lord Wind or not Lord Wind um, Arcadia's is fantastic just because if you don't have Arcadia's on the field, you've got a bunch of blockers, so you're not getting attacked typically most often than not, um, because no one's attacking through your walls. Because what's the what's the point? 
Um, and if you do work haze on the field, it just turns everyone's heads just spin around, just spin around because they're just like, wait, it's a what now? It's an eight eight in the air. When did you play that? Um, turn two. <laughs> it's a two drop. <laughs> like so it, it, it's it gets the best reactions because it's something that it's really really hard to kind of deal with. And the cool thing about arcades is the fact that whenever a defender comes into play, you draw a card. So it's got that sudden SRAM ability where it's like, you know, you're, just, you're constantly refilling your hand. And there's been many of times where I'm just like, you know, because because most walls, the most expensive wall CMC-wise is four mana. If you've got like 10 mana on board, not even mentioning the, the guys that actually tap for mana when it comes to the walls, um, he's on the screen right now and just hearts. But it's one of those things that you can just go five, six, seven walls just dropping in one after another. Um, there is Ambition or Ambigance, something. It's two green green. Um, and it basically states that whenever you would draw a card, you can instead choose a non-land card or a land, and then you actually draw, you reveal cards from your library and then you draw back. If you have had a field with Arcades, you basically just name non-land every single time. You're hitting a you're hitting a defender who then you're immediately casting, who then hit another defender, who then you're immediately casting. Like that, that gets crazy really fast. Um, the new card um, from Ravica Allegiance, I believe, um, High Alerts, does the exact same thing as Arcades, except mm -hmm. for the fact that you don't need Arcades in the field. So if Arcades gets too expensive, where like, you know, four to six to eight to ten, it does get kind of expensive after a while. If you have a High Alert on the field, you don't need them. You can just attack mm -hmm. and then just kill someone. There's been plenty of times where I've just played Arcades on like turn like six or seven after I put up a bunch of walls. I just straight kill someone because. How are you going to deal with the 6-6 six, six, and 8-8 eight, eight, and the 7-7 seven, seven, all attacking all at once? You really can't. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. Um, not to mention if you give them all a trample or something in that sense or whatever. It just gets really, really crazy, really broken, um, really, really fast, and I just love it absolutely today. Now we're hopping over to our cleanup step um, where I basically say thank you, thank you, thank you for watching this episode. Um, the first episode went off with a hitch. Um, now, uh, current recording, whatever, we've got roughly around like 20 or something views. Um, we got a bunch of new subscribers, which obviously that's kind of how it works, because mm -hmm. we got a bunch of new guys. Um, so thank you guys for that. Make sure to actually hit that smash, that crap out of that like button. Um, comment down below as well. We want to kind of hear from you guys, just kind of a way of just stating, hey, we want to see this. Or like, you know, we want to talk about that deck. Like, you know, this deck seems really cool. We want to hear about it. Um, we definitely want to hear about that for the most part. And... Subscribe. This way you can stay up to date on new episodes. We're planning on dropping every single episode once a week. Maybe on Thursday, maybe on Friday, depending on how that works out. Um, and yeah, just... Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>